non-theist organizations in that area and, and get some media attention for that. Kind of like a little anti-defamation uh, watchdog uh, thing for, uh, for atheists, so it's high time for that. So anyway, uh, I think that uh, that takes care of just the opening announcements. Again, welcome back to the show. Here we are. And now we're going to go on over to David for today's news. What's okay. happening in the world? Man? Well, before we get into news, mm. I've got the very end of last week's show. The, the last caller, she was on maybe 15, 20 seconds. I remember that. And, and I, of course, we didn't have time to answer her at all. Yes, I'm going to address that in a second. <laughs> but but uh, my, uh, the thing that I wanted to address about that last call, and I hope that you're listening, uh, if you were the caller last week that we were not able to address, uh, the, the, she called and was all sweetness and light and telling us that uh, we should not be judgmental. We should not be so judgmental. And then she told us that she would pray for us, and then she told us that God rebukes us. Now, <laughs> That's what's the point? So, doesn't do, the Bible teach us, judge not, lest ye be judged? There you go. I, I think so, Lisa. So, <laughs> so I, I've, got, I've got a little beef here, which is don't call up and act sweet and pious and humble and tell me you're speaking for God, mm. for one, because that just washes that out the window. <laughs> and two, don't call up and tell me that God is rebuking me or God is sending me to hell or God is doing... Don't call up and tell me that. If your whatever deity you like is so powerful, tell him to go ahead and come down and do it to me here in person on the show. <laughs> Great publicity. <laughs> but don't call up and claim to speak for God yeah. and don't call up and act humble. Don't, can't do those two things together. Yeah. Well, uh, that's my gripe. Well, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> she's probably just like fumbling for something to say really quickly because she was coming on like the last 30 seconds of the show. So it was just natural yeah. for her to say, I rebuke you? Well, <laughs> God rebuke well, you. Well, I mean, just think about it. I mean, clearly that's not the, the, the kind of thing. I mean, if, to say in the same breath that I'm praying to my God for you, for your benefit or whatever, but he rebukes you. Meanwhile, you're rebuked. Yeah, in which case I say, well, you know, what's the point? You know, just don't <laughs> right. waste your time and, which you know, we won't it? worry about it and, you know, who cares? <laughs> But uh, anyway, uh, I do have a do have a little uh, you know, just a couple words I would like to say about last week's show, and uh, just to uh, sometimes in the beginning of the show we'll just take care of some old business if there is some of that. And um, last week's show is one of those that occasion occasionally this happens. Got a little out of hand. Um, on this program, we try to extend every courtesy uh, to callers. You know, we're here. This is a live call-in television show, and we're perfectly happy. We, we have folks who call in and. They disagree with us or they don't understand what atheism is and we let them ask us questions and then we have a dialogue, we have an exchange. And when you have that kind of setup um, like we have, you know, every once in a while you get somebody who kind of abuses the courtesy. And we had this caller who was, uh, who's one of these guys who just kind of rambles on and, you know, wasn't allowing us to answer his questions. You know, we, he would ask a question and his questions were of such an outrageous nature that we were just like, ah, you know, and all sort of trying to jump in and answer him at once. And when we answered him, he would either just completely talk over our answer, so that you know it's clear that he wasn't intending to listen to us. He just had his script that he was working from, or um, once we answered the question and addressed the point he was making, he would just want to go, "Okay, now let's go on to the next topic." Right. You know, this sort of like hit and run thing where he doesn't, you know, acknowledge the fact that we have addressed the issue he's brought up. He just wants to like throw all kinds of crap at us and see what sticks, right? And. It ended up to where, and it was so outrageous that uh, it just ended up kind of degenerating into chaos on our end. And I'm sorry for that, because that's kind of my responsibility. I'm here trying to, you know, as host, you got to be, you're the guy whose job it is to referee the, you know, the, the, the way the whole show goes and, and all of that. And it just sort of like descended into chaos up to, up to the point where I lost my temper on the air a couple times, which I never like to do. So I'm very sorry that happened. But, if, you know, it's live TV and it happens and it gets spontaneous. I mean, uh, all the emails that I've gotten from folks are like, you know, Martin, don't worry about it. The guy was a complete moron. I mean, he was just saying stuff like, uh, you know, like his, his proof for the fact that we were all designed by his wonderful God was that, you know, the human bodies and all the organs always work perfectly at birth or something. <laughs> was like, you know, clearly he's never heard of, you know, all these myriad birth defects that can and hap do happen all the time to babies. So it's just, he was just saying complete nonsense. And... He, he should have been a guy who was easy to shut down very quickly. But I didn't do that, and the call like rattled on for 20 minutes, and it crowded out other callers who didn't get to have their allotted period of time. You know, so it, and, and so, that was un, so that was unfair to them. So you know, it happens and what have you. So we'll move on. So ultimately, we, even though we want to take calls, and, and we'd love to have a, a, even a long conversation, the nature of mm -hmm. the show does not allow that. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're, you know, it, if you're a caller and, and you have what you think are a lot of great points to make, uh, and we have to cut you off, you know, it's just something that we have to do because we have 
other people that want to speak in a limited amount of time. So right. uh, we just like have to go with that. Please. Certainly, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mm. on to the news. Yeah, yeah let's okay. do it. Uh, attorneys for Chief Justice Roy Moore deny claims that his Ten Commandments monument in the State Judicial Building is an endorsement of religion. Now that surprises me that uh, he's claiming that. Well, what would it be in, in uh, then? Uh, what would it? It, it, it is. An, it, attorneys, uh, Moore's attorneys, said that it is not reasonable for the 5,280-pound monument to be viewed as endorsing religion. It is a monument of the Ten Commandments. Uh, the public acknowledgement of God is not religion, and in no way runs contrary to the First Amendment. Wait, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> the public acknowledgement of God is not religion. And in no way runs contrary to the First Amendment. Okay. Now, uh, of course, there have been lawsuits filed. Yeah. And that's, that, that's like saying, you know, uh, you know, a porno movie isn't a porno movie if, you know, if, if the people in it can actually act. Right. Or something, you know. <laughs> like well, it makes you know that may be a definition of... <laughs> oh, well, okay, maybe that wasn't a good analogy, uh, but it's but, sort of like... <laughs> uh, but there have been uh, lawsuits filed, and of course they're going to be fighting this in court, but mm. I, I just, I find it odd... Uh, if uh, it's it's interesting to me, if a monument was put in the Capitol Rotunda, uh, acknowledging uh, in Quetzalcoatl or mm -hmm. or Zeus a, as a god, right. that that the very first commandment to that god said, "I'm the only god, and you shouldn't worship any other god but me." I wonder if uh, Judge Moore would say that that's religion and that goes against the First Amendment. Well, probably. I, I mean, think that he would. Uh, yeah. So it's just, it's obvious that... Uh, well, the central question, of course, is, you know, if you put this blatantly religious document, okay, the only source for which we have is out of this, like, religious tome, okay? I mean, this Bible, which mm -hmm. is... So, so the, the document comes from the holy book of a religion, okay? The first four commandments of this document are, uh, you know, of these commandments are to, you know, worship and acknowledge the, you know, the God of Judeo-Christianity above all others. And it obviously, if followed, sets in place a theocratic uh, yeah. dictatorship. So. Yeah, so I mean, if, if the purpose of putting this in a big public building is not to promote the religion it comes from, what could it be possibly, what could possibly be the purpose? I don't understand the purpose then, if it's not religion. I mean, that's just hogwash. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's quite I don't see how he could defend that statement. Well, he's going to try in court, uh. so however, uh, there have been uh, many previous court precedents set sure. where uh, even up to the Supreme Court that have definitely recognized the Ten Commandments as a purely religious mm -hmm. uh, text uh, specific to particular religions. Yeah. So that's really going to work against, against him in this. Is this the same guy where they put up the, the, uh, the empty frame in the same building to say... And this is for all those people who don't believe no, in anything. I, no, I don't think that is. Yeah. That's okay, not, there's, that's another the one. I think that's a different yeah. one. Yes, that's but it <laughs> just goes to show, like, just the sheer, you know, uh, they don't even make a pretense of not being completely arrogant and right. pompous about this. <laughs> right. You know, it's like, you know, and it, it's, it's just like, in your face, we don't care about anyone who thinks any differently than we do on this matter. You know, we're in charge, and, and we're just going to, you know, steamroll right over you and deal with it. You know, that's their attitude, and they don't even make a pretense that that's not the attitude. It's amazing. Well, uh, another interesting thing, a, a recent article in Washington Post mm -hmm. uh, says that uh, Pat Robertson's resignation this month as president of the Christian Coalition confirmed the ascendance of a new leader of the religious right in America, George W. Bush. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it makes a, a case for that. Uh, uh, Gary Bauer, a religious conservative who challenged mm -hmm. Bush in the Republican primary, said, I think Robertson stepped down because the position has already been filled. Uh, Bush is that leader right now. There was already a great deal of identification with the president before 9-11 in the world of the Christian right, and the nature of this war is such that it's heightened the sense that a man of God is in the White House. Uh, Ralph Reed, mm -hmm. of course, uh, mm -hmm. who once had the Christian coalition, he's now chairman of the Georgia GOP. Uh, he, oh, he is? Yes. Uh, okay. He noted that, uh, that the religious conservative movement no longer plays the institutional role it once did, uh, in part because it succeeded in electing Bush and other friendly leaders. His quote was, you're no longer throwing rocks at the building, you're in the building. Saying that... Yeah, throwing you, rocks out at the American people. Right. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, Reed says, I've heard a lot of God knew something we didn't. In the evangelical mind, the notion of an omniscient God is central to their theology. He had a knowledge nobody else had. He knew George Bush had the ability to lead in this compelling way. Okay. Uh, and so, did he have knowledge about the September 11th attacks? That's <laughs> that what I want to know. That would be interesting. World uh -huh. Magazine, which okay. is edited by one-time Bush advisor Marvin Olasky, now uh, mm -hmm. wonderful con conservative 
compassionate conservative yeah, from he UT. Came up with that. Uh, UT journalism U professor. UT yeah. journalism professor. He named Bush's attorney general John Ashcroft. It's uh, this magazine, World Magazine, named John Ashcroft. It's Daniel of the Year. Uh, Ashcroft himself considered running for president. Just as the biblical Daniel faced an established idol worshiping religion in Babylon, so <laughs> are Dan's, and he's talking about John Ashcroft and Bush must not back down in the face of deadly persecution abroad or the scorn and harassment that comes domestically from the academic and media high priests of our established religion, <laughs> secular liberalism. <laughs> God! So, uh, this, 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 that's like every paranoid freak out, you know, term, you know well, I, I, convenient I, I, little far-right wing term that you could pack into one sentence. I read he a, just got them all in there. Oh yeah. I, the I, only I, thing he left out was all. like, you know, gay and lesbian agenda conspiracy thing. I read Olaskin's wow. uh, columns in the Austin American Statesman regularly, and, and he's pretty much got all the paranoid uh, uh, schizophrenia, whatever you want to call it, all right in there. Yeah, this, the this is what is astonishing about these folks, right? I mean, uh, on the one hand, right, when it serves their political purpose, for example, you have something like getting the Ten Commandments into, you know, schools or, or courthouses or capitol buildings or something like that. They immediately like to throw at you, oh, well, we're clearly in the majority here. I mean, the public has voted and, you know, That's 90s. Right. This is what America wants. Yeah, and blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, you know, just, you know, the numbers are on our side, so, you know, screw y'all. But then when, it's, when anyone speaks up and says, um, excuse me, you know, things like uh, religious freedom and uh, you know, no government interference and da 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 they immediately switch tack, they do a 180, and suddenly they're this oppressed minority, <laughs> yes, right, walking minority. around with the back of their hand nailed to their head, like, oh, you know, woe is us, you know, and, and the most, I, mean, I, I have it somewhere in here in my thing, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, so I printed up Pat all Robertson. 10 pages. <laughs> of the Pat Robertson quotes from the Positive Atheist website. More than any minority in history. Is yeah, it's astonishing. He, he actually comes, he actually claims that uh, Christians in America are like the most, uh, up in modern day America, are like the most oppressed group in human history. More, than any, more than any more group than in history any, ever. It's like, hmm, gee, maybe I missed that, you know, article in the news. Oh, but of course it wouldn't have been reported because the news is confronted, is, is controlled by, you know, the godless liberal conspiracy. But, you know, I, I, just, I just missed that information where, like, tens and tens of thousands of Christians are being rounded up and, like, taken to concentration camps and, and gassed and then cremated. <laughs> gee, um, you know, how could I have overlooked that that was going on in, in my very backyard? You know, just astonishing. This is the level of self, there's the self-absorption to the point where they don't even realize well, they're talking know, out of both sides of their mouths. You've got to you know, realize, you know, we do yeah. have the Christians only drinking fountains and the Christians only bathrooms. That's that right. Got to and, use. and those poor <laughs> Christians always have to ride in the back of the bus and it's just <laughs> horrible. Horrible. The, the oppression that they suffer day to day. Ugh. So, so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, they now, use course, it again, both ways. Now, again, we had a caller, you know, call us on this last week. Of course, most like mainstream you know, Christians who are like normal up here to us, you know, to most you know definitions of the term, they don't follow what these clowns like Robertson and Falwells have to say. I mean, they're these these guys are on the fringe, and the only reason they appear to be in any sort of degree of power at all is because the media, which I actually think, uh, in, it, I guess it depends on the network, but I see more of a conservative leaning in the media than uh, than, than a liberal one. But you know, it's it's, it's that uh, these media uh, forums continue to give them credence. You know, Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson still like appear as guests frequently on these, you know, talking head news shows where they, you know, consult experts on you know, what's going on in the world today. Right, right. You know, and if and if there seems like there's anything that pertains to like m morality or family values or this or that or the other, you know, immediately the person they have as a spokesperson for that point of view is this is this lunatic like Robertson, you know, um, who, who <laughs> who says things like, um, you know, Planned Parenthood is teaching kids to fornicate, teaching people to have adultery, every kind of bestiality, homosexuality, lesbianism, everything that the Bible condemns. I mean, the, a guy who, like, makes wild-ass statements like that, you know, gets to appear on, on network television as if he is some sort of... I said that uh, Orlando was going to get hit by hurricanes and a meteor. <laughs> <laughs> now there you go, right? I mean, there so it's so, but so it's outrageous. He has his views legitimized by by the regular media, yeah. Uh, and and unfortunately, a lot of, I guess I would say, and you said, normal Christians that wouldn't mm -hmm. follow that sort of re hate-filled rhetoric yeah. are are labeled along with that because he has become one of the you know your your spokesperson, mm -hmm. and so that's that's pretty sad. Well, didn't you have the thing last week where um, Falwell wrote that letter? Was it a fundraising letter or? No, um, where he was talking about uh, 
being Com being uh, compared, compared to, the, to the Taliban. Yeah. Yes. Now, people are comparing him to the Taliban. I can understand, but he tried to spin that to where it uh, seems like all uh, Christians in America. Yeah. Are if they're saying it about him, they're saying it about all of you, and that's how he tries to like. Because you know. he's the standard for Christian normalcy in his mm -hmm. mind, yeah, which is scary in and of itself. But so. uh, something that was interesting in the Austin American Statesman this week, they had an article about Melvin Hale, okay. the uh, the elderly gentleman that shot and killed Trooper Randall Vetter. At oh the right, stop. they had that big funeral for him. Yes, and. Okay. Uh, Hale's attorney is saying that Hale is incompetent to stand trial and that he's crazy because he believes that he was doing God's will and that he believes that God is going to intervene in his trial to set him free. And that obviously he's incompetent to stand trial. Now, well, now he know, could just be saying that to but, get that insanity plea. Right. Yeah. But however, what I find interesting is that a large percentage, I would say, of American society uh, mm -hmm. believes, at least offhandedly, believes that God can intervene in their lives on a daily, personal basis, and many of them believe they are trying to live their lives towards God's will, mm -hmm. and we don't consider them incompetent and insane. Yeah. Now, while there may be good reason to link religion and, and, and mental illness, mm -hmm. uh, I, I find it curious that uh, he's, it seems like he's trying to use uh, religion to get off. Mm -hmm. of this to get to escape this conviction mm -hmm. when what he's actually saying is the same thing that people around the world think quite a bit God I pray to God he will intervene in my daily life yeah uh, but of course in his case he's saying it because like he's committed this atrocious crime and see so when you invoke God to justify an atrocious crime everybody thinks you're a looney tune when you invoke God to like you know say help with my marriage or my job or this or that Nobody seems to think you're a Looney Tune right, for some reason. Right. Although I don't know what you know, I, you're talking to some invisible guy, so that he'll have, like whisper advice in your ear. In either is is <laughs> any more or less lunatic depending on what you're asking for. But I don't know. I think it's you know, I think this is his ploy to just try to like get off with insanity, and so he can like spend you know just 20 years in whatever either a tennis prison or in. Some, no, they did, uh, however, they hospital. actually did find him competent to stand trial. Right, so, so it, it didn't work. It didn't yeah, work, I mean it was so. clearly a ruse. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's. It, but you're, you're right. It is amusing how you know the the minute, uh, you know, it's all, you know, religion can just sort of be tailored to whatever you want to be tailored to at that moment. You know, yep. it's it's this all-purpose glove that kind of fits. Uh, on to another thing that I find interesting: the Freedom from Religion Foundation mm -hmm. uh, filed a lawsuit against a a. Uh, it's called FaithWorks, and they were a. Uh, let me see a. Ministry devoted to bringing homeless addicts directly to Christ. Now, FaithWorks was touted by candidate, then candidate George W. Bush during an August 2000 cam campaign stop to the Milwaukee convent, which it rents, mm -hmm. as the type of faith based group to which Bush intends to funnel millions and millions of tax dollars. Okay. Now, Freedom from Religion Foundation filed a lawsuit claiming that the money being given to FaithWorks was unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. They won the lawsuit. Uh, a federal right. judge uh, ruled that it was indeed unconstitutional. The bad part about this, one million dollars has already been given to FaithWorks that cannot be recovered. Mm. One million dollars of, of tax money, uh, yeah. federal money, has been given and it has been ruled unconstitutional. That money will never be recovered. Oh, oh well. Um, well, you know, that's it's but a, I find a million dollars that, is, you know, for government waste is that's a pittance. I find it interesting that, that this yeah. is the very uh, right. organization that Bush said this is exactly the type of organization I want to give money and the very first challenge in court yeah. unconstitutional because now it wasn't it wasn't true that the Freedom from Religion Foundation did find out in fact that FaithWorks was requiring people who sought its help for whatever you know social service it provides to attend religious um, you know uh, services right that was part that yeah. was part they of had to the, do it though if yes, you came it, into faith it, works it was and part of the program yeah want to get off crack or whatever some sort yeah. of religious indoctrination was part yeah. of the program okay so which uh, which i you know i mean i get it and this is this is why I, I found it was so bizarre that um bush when he was first trying to push his whole faith-based initiative was trying to draw this distinction between oh well you know we think that you know just because a charity is you know like faith-based that they shouldn't you know be not allowed to apply for the same funding yada 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 
you know, and what we're just covering is the social services that they provide, and we're not allowing them to use any of this money for, you know, their proselytizing. And, but the immediate, uh, you know, response to that is, but if these things are faith-based organizations, then the faith that they're rooted in is all part of the social service. It's got to be. That's why they're called faith-based. Well, you know, an interesting little thing about that, yeah. that if, uh, one of the, the very first thing that Bush did when he got into office mm -hmm. was cancel any federal funding going to any, uh, any uh, reproductive services overseas. Mm -hmm. any, anything, any reproductive service group that performed abortions mm -hmm. to any women at all uh, were canceled federal funding. Now, most of these places that got uh, the money canceled, actually the, the actual abortions performed were like 1% of what they actually did. Yeah. But Bush said, wait a second, yeah. this money can't be differentiated. If you get it for one thing, it will automatically be funneled into the rest of the organization. I don't like that. And yet, with the faith-based funding, he's saying, we can just channel it to social services and it won't get used to the ministry. Yeah. So, which is it? It, yeah. w where is it going to go? Because it, when that it's something he doesn't the, the, like, the, 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 the groups that like supplied uh, birth control, right? Yes, yeah, it, it, it hit all kinds of stuff. But it was interesting. His uh, it, basically the same issue. Uh, mm -hmm. He says in one instance we can fund this and we cannot fund this uh, reproductive services and keep it uh, from going to the abortion part of it. Yeah. And yet for faith-based initiatives, he says we can fund the social services and keep it out of the ministerial hands, and it doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting, okay, of course, depending on what he, yeah, yeah, you know. Both sides of the mouth there. Uh, on a lighter side, uh, <laughs> and still interesting, a man is suing in Newport, Newport Beach, California. He's mm -hmm. filed a federal lawsuit uh, alleging that the city unconstitutional, unconstitutionally violated the separation of church and state by allowing churchgoers free access to already tight beach parking. Uh, okay. uh, John Nelson, uh, 53 <laughs> years old, a Newport Beach developer contractor, uh, said, I believe that every citizen has a responsibility to be vigilant to make sure the provisions of the Constitution are not diluted. Uh, at issue is a city ordinance passed in the 1970s that allowed free mm -hmm. parking on Sundays between 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. at metered parking spots in front of four churches mm -hmm. uh, along some of the heavier right. street. Now, uh, so uh, I, th I think he has a point. And, and mm, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm this a is skeptical what, of his motives. But this is what's interesting. Okay. Monsignor Daniel J. Murray of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church, okay. one of the churches that benefits from free parking, said the church has been there longer than the parking meters. And he also said that the Constitution provides for the free exercise of religion. Therefore, people should be able to park freely to go to church. <laughs> if people don't have quarters, they can't come to church, he said, of the parking meter charges. That's an interesting interpretation of the free exercise uh, of religion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I guess, you know, you pick your fights where you find them. I don't know. I think that that's... And that's that, the news. That's, yeah. <laughs> that might, I, I think that probably qualifies for Tempest in a Teapot. But, uh, right, right. Yeah, uh, but, uh, you know, it's... <laughs> it's funny. Well, in a sense, I mean, if, like, if you go to you know, some malls where they have, like, parking meters, and if you go in a shop, you know, they'll show you, if you take your ticket in or something, or, like, in a parking garage, and they'll stamp your ticket, and you can get free parking there if you know, like, you're having to do something to do with the business that's nearby. Um, I don't... I don't. Now, think however, this is this is public street parking, and so the interesting thing is, I suppose anybody could park there. You don't have to go to the church. I don't. Know, I don't. I know that California, Southern California, is like this big, you know, pay parking scam all over this right. spread across. So I mean, but do they uh, here in town? You don't have to like on Sundays pay at the meters. Right. You right? you do there. Or you do there. But the interesting thing is, mm -hmm. uh, the the one thing that kind of makes me go, well, it's not that big a deal, is that anybody mm -hmm. could park there. Mm -hmm. the, it's just the meters that were in front of the churches. So conceivably. A group of you know a hundred atheists could go to every church in, <laughs> that has it and park there at like 5 a.m. on Sunday and use all the spaces. And the problem would be when they came out and said this is for church parking only. Uh, then to me that would be the problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, they just need to you know just build their own lot or whatever. Yeah. Yes, whatever. Uh, where, yeah. where would Jesus park? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. What would Jesus drive? That's right. uh, yeah. The little Hyde Park thing <laughs> all over. <laughs> Uh, what's that? Whatever happened with that debacle? I I, still I don't think being batted around. I think around it's still or? being batted around um, in some manner, some form. Now, speaking of like you know separation issues, something like, I don't actually have the the printout with me. I'm sure you heard the thing that's been going on last week with the um, uh, the uh, American Center for Law and Justice or mm, whatever, which yes. is the Robertson and the Secular legal arm of the of the 700 Club Christian Coalition yeah. type thing, I believe. There's this stink. 
that has arisen in a school. And, and I know we have callers on the line, so please uh, hang loose and we'll get to you first uh, in just a second. There's a stink that has been uh, brought up where apparently in some school out in California, the claim is on the part of the ACLJ and all of the, you know, the, the, the Christian right flunkies is that children are being required to undertake like Muslim religious practices. Um, in fact, this even made it on to like some mainstream oh, yes. news. Yeah, they, they have to stage their own jihad. Yeah, they have to stage <laughs> their own jihad, and well, they, at least that's the claim, right? right, uh, right. They have to like um, you know wear the you know the, the headdress garb. and stuff, and, and do and like engage in this. Now, um, as I understand it, it's not. It's a little you know distorted the way they were reporting it. Apparently, the kids. It's a humanities class. And they, it's like, and there, there's a comparative religion sex segment to that. And uh, I think the jihad <laughs> that kids are supposed to, do, which I think it's, you know, if nothing else, you can say it's in bad taste to <laughs> have that in the curriculum right now. It was like a, a, a dice throwing game. It was like a game they played mm. in class or something. Uh, but um, in any event, the uh, ACLJ, like you know, went into apoplexy about this and threw a big fit. And they're, and they're claiming that this is a violation of separation of church and state. And they, these guys, these fundamentalist Christians, yes. are actually coming out and saying, you can't have religious stuff in and schools. And you can't instruct. And, well, yeah. as long as it's... Yeah. As long as, as it... If, yeah, if it isn't, you if know, it isn't our religion. Our religion you know, but yes. they're not saying that. They're suddenly just coming out and acting like they're these big champions for separation of church and state. <laughs> because, you know, there's Islam is, is being, you know, addressed in this class. I don't know exactly how it's being addressed, but I have... Um, well, uh, they're 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 making a big tizzy of it. They're they're I guess they're the visions of little kids, you know, donning uh, you know the the, <laughs> the the gear and strapping on an AK <laughs> or something. And getting out and well, you know, anything you that know. the American Center for Law and Justice, co uh, any yeah. claim they make, I, I think should be treated with some dubiousness at first. They yeah. are the same group that has claimed in different uh, things that got a lot of media attention. Things mm. such as. Oh, uh, a, a child was, uh, Bible was confiscated and thrown in the trash at school and things of that nature. Uh, oh. uh, and told that if you pray over your, your meal at lunchtime, uh, you will be kicked out of school. Mm. And of course, when it's actually investigated, none of these things happened. Yeah. So, Although if it did happen, that would be illegal. That's right. That and would we would not agree with that. That's right. So anyway, we got callers lined up. Let's uh, see what, uh, we'll start with Ed on line one. Hello, Ed. Yeah, I can barely hear you. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll adjust the sound here in the uh, studio right quick. We can uh, hear you, though. Uh, go ahead. What's your question? Um, I've listened to you guys before, uh, not you specifically, but I guess your group. And, and uh, the question that I have is that any time that I have tuned in, um, you're basically making fun of the Christian religion and things that, that they stand for. But one thing that... I always have wanted to listen from you guys or anybody else in the atheist community is why don't you explain to to the viewers or anyone that is willing to listen what y'all stand for and how you come to your way of thinking. Okay. Thank you very much for my, taking my call. Sure. Thank, Thank you, for, you calling. for calling. We appreciate that. Um, well, that we, we do uh, address that topic, um, you know, when, when it comes up. I mean, part of what the point of the show is, and... Um, now keep in mind, yeah, I mean, there's you, you'll get a lot of a okay, lighthearted mockery on this, and sometimes not so lighthearted mockery on this show because there are people out there doing outrageous stuff, you know, exploiting for their own personal gain their religious beliefs and, and what have you. Um, and it is true that as atheists, part of the reason we're atheists is that we do think the claims of Christianity are, are so much nonsense. So, uh, so it shouldn't be surprised, you know, surprising to you if you know you hear us, um, you know, making fun of that now and again. But in terms of addressing, you know, how it is that atheists go about making decisions in life and stuff and, and what it is that we think about things and how we address the various problems that other people, you know, use their religious faith to address, you know, I mean, that all does sort of come into it. I mean, if you want to know specifically, we could tell you if you like. Sure. I mean, if you want to go into that yeah. for a sec. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, um, you start. Well, I think uh, in general, uh, it's, uh, atheism and a lot of this is on our, uh, our FAC. On yeah. our website, also, uh, yeah, they, they can put that up there and uh, on the screen. It's a, it's a, yeah, just put our website address up for like two seconds and click and on the uh, fact and you'll find it. Uh, however, we'll go ahead and, and real quick go over some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Atheism is simply uh, means without God, yeah. uh, without a, a deity, uh, uh, or without a belief in a deity. Uh, we, we do not uh, call on any supernatural entity, whether it's the God of the Christian Bible or Zeus or... 
you know, mm -hmm. in, in, any supernatural deity or, uh, or force uh, in our life. Uh, and... Oh, that's loud next door. Okay, anyway. uh, I thought that was our phone for a minute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and uh, so we base our decisions on... Uh, now, I guess decisions, you could be talking about all kinds of things. There's all kinds of layers you can go into in terms of morality mm -hmm. or, or just if you just want to talk about how we come to our atheism, I'd say for each individual, that's probably a little different. Uh, I came to my atheism after, after being raised as a fundamentalist Christian. I uh, preached sermons and performed baptisms before I was ever even out of high school. I attended a Christian college and majored in theology to become a minister. It was at the Christian college that uh, I realized that the questions that I had had my whole life were not being answered effectively, and I started to really look at the Bible in an objective manner. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that happened was that I was struck by the cruelty that was a, a common theme throughout the Bible by the God of the Bible. And I said, I can't serve any being that is, more, or is less moral than I am. Mm. So uh, that wasn't an atheist yet at that point. I had just determined that I could not, in good conscience, follow the God of the Christian Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't that much of a leap from there in terms of study and uh, introspection to become an atheist. Um, mm -hmm. And I make decisions based on uh, my own morals, which I do not believe require a divine being, uh, of a, a, a divine nature. I, I realize that we in a society live in a society for the benefits of a society and don't believe that any mm -hmm. religious dictates are needed. Uh, but, you're, but when you say your own morals, I mean, you do, they are based on something, right? You're not just saying, I make up what I feel like to do, right, and that's right. okay. Right, yeah, uh, that, yes, that, yeah. Is, that is true. Uh, yeah, yeah my, my morals are based on the fact that uh, I believe that, well, for one, I believe life is valuable because I believe that this is the only life that we have. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, uh, as to much Christian theology, uh, says that this life is, is worthless, it's nothing, this is just an empty shell and this is rags and we're waiting for the big pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. that's really, I think that's devaluing life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I find that life is very valuable and therefore I find that we should treat life valuable and I I will I, I think along the lines of you know if I want to do something I think is this harming the person or property of another yeah. because that is not I don't have a right to do that we're all trying to get along in this world and we need to get along together mm -hmm. and and I really think that it's pretty simple actually mm -hmm. to live in a society a common sense dictates yeah, many of the ways in which you need to live look at the consequences of your actions right. before you act yeah and um, I, I would agree with, with pretty much all of that and only add that um, well, there's a really terrific quote, and I forget who, but, um, you know, when you usually, uh, most Christians, I think, if you a would ask them, would tell you that they do not believe in the gods of other religions like Zeus or Thor or Odin right. or, you know, Mithras or, or the, you know, all those great Egyptian gods with the bird heads and stuff. And um, their, their reasons for not believing in those gods are pretty much my same reason for not believing in theirs. You know, right. They have no evidence for those gods, and they think the existence of those gods is just wildly improbable, so they choose not to believe in them. That's my summation, that's my opinion of the Christian gods. So I tell them, you know, uh, you know think of all these other gods of all the other religions that have ever existed throughout uh, the history of the world. When you understand why it is that you don't believe in their gods, you will understand why I don't believe in your god. Simple as that. Anyway, Malcolm's been waiting for some time. Let's see what he has to say. Hello, Malcolm. Hi. Hey, you're on the air. Thanks for waiting. Hi. This is a question about the, I guess, the life discussion that you just had. This is in reference to the stem cell debate that sort of hushed up after September 11th. Uh, currently, the University of Pennsylvania has come out with some data that is strongly suggesting that human beings may not be able to be fully cloned due to the complexity of the genome. Okay. And if this is true, and therefore, by, say, harvesting totipotent stem cells, you technically are not committing an abortion, thus you're not committing um, a murder of any kind or an abortion, as the right to life people seem to holler about. And if this is true, uh, well, what is the atheist perspective on this? I'll hang up, and if you've heard anything about this more, I would appreciate it. Thanks. Sure, sure. Thank you for your question. Um, I don't know that there's, a, there's an overall atheist perspective on it. I, I can give you my perspective personally as an atheist, and so can David. Um, my take on the whole stem cell thing was that, um, you know, these, uh, 
you know, I, these, uh, these embryos that are being used, first off, um, you get into this sort of emotionally loaded um, uh, uh, bouts of rhetoric that come back and forth. And essentially, one thing that you have to uh, understand about, for example, the human reproductive process is that the overwhelming majority of embryos are, are, are naturally aborted anyway. I mean, just, you know, the, the uh, most, uh, um, it's, it's, it's pregnancy and bringing, a, bringing a, a baby to term is a very, very difficult process. Um, the, uh, and as far as the, the embryos that are being used for this research, <clears throat> I mean, these things were never people. They're not, they're not even on their way to being turned into people. Um, I, I, in some cases, I mean, I know that they do make some of these, uh, these embryos available for couples who uh, cannot, I guess, reproduce on their own, and so they do this in vitro thing. But, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's, this is not a thing where, you know, a, a, it, the, the image that is brought to bear by the, 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 the pro-life committee is that, uh, is, is or community, I should say, is that there is this big plot, okay, where, you know, men and guns are gonna kick down your doors and, you know, grab your, you know, your precious little baby out of your hands and uh, rush out the door with it to, you know, stick a needle in its brain and suck out its stem cells. And, you know, that's all alarmism and, and fear-mongering. It's not like that at all. Um, but, but keep in mind, uh, with the whole, all these, the cloning issue and stem cells and, and all of these things having to do with biotechnology, is that um, biotechnology, it's going to develop. You know, it's, it's the, the science, you, you can't really kind of stop the progression of, like, knowledge once it gets going. And uh, you ha you, granted, you have to work out the ethical issues because clearly there are ways in which any sort of discovery or any sort of research can get misused. You know, I mean, atomic research can be wonderfully beneficial to the human race or it can make bombs that can blow up cities and you have to kind of weigh, you know, how you're going to do that and what the ethical applications of a, of a particular science are. But, you know, the fact is that we, you know, you, we're living now in a world where, you know, the, uh, the hair that comes out in your hairbrush is a potential person, you know. I mean, all of your DNA strand is there. And uh, right now, you know, cloning technology is not to the point where, you know, you're right. I mean, we, it's, it's just, it's impractical to clone complete human beings. And I don't see, again, this horror scenario of a, of a bleak clone-filled future that the anti-clone, you know, people are, are predicting uh, for one thing, it's just, you know, it's an impractical way to create new people. It's more fun to do it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> so I don't really see, like, cloning being this new cottage industry where, you know, like, there was that horrible Schwarzenegger movie where, like, that came out a couple years ago. Where, and, 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 like, cloning is like you just stick yourself in a machine and you Xerox yourself. Uh, you know, that, that's not what it's all about. <laughs> um, look, I support, just, I'm rambling, but I'll just make my point really quickly. I support anything, any sort of technology that enhances the quality of life. Okay, on, um, you know, just, just for people at large. Um, you know, I don't uh, support anything that would be flagrantly unethical. Uh, but again, you have to look at a case-by-case -case basis and see exactly what, uh, you know, what lines may or may not be getting crossed in that situation. And it's real, and it's real weird. Um, I don't think cloning right now is the way to go because there, it's demonstrably, uh, you know, imperfect and unsafe. And, but I still think that it should be continued to be researched on, though. Because I think that therapeutic cloning, for example, can have a great many benefits. You come down with like liver cancer or something, or you need a transplant really bad, you know, instead of getting on a waiting list for two years to get your new liver, wouldn't it be great if they could use your DNA and just grow you a new liver with your own DNA? I mean, I think that that technology would, uh, you know, I, I don't see how anybody could possibly. Mm. I'm, well, but Criticize. people do, but yeah. I, I pretty much agree with, with what you've said, but uh, as for, just to, to uh, reiterate to the caller. I don't. I don't think the atheist community of Austin has any, any official, policy official or official position, official position yeah. on s stem cell or cloning or anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you ask for the atheist position uh, on on any issue, you literally could get thousands of different answers because uh, atheism at its core simply means without belief yeah. in a supreme being, without belief in a god. And we have atheists in our group that are. Are Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, so uh, conservatives, uh, right, liberals. Everything the the only thing that probably is is really binding for certain in our group is 
uh, atheism and probably separation of church and state, First Amendment uh, activities. Yeah. Uh, and that's probably, you may find that uh, for the most part wherever you go, but you're going to find a lot of differences in the atheist community, which I find really interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have a... In it hasn't quite been so boisterous lately, but our very own e you know, email list has oh, quite yes, often erupted in heated arguments about, uh, you know, between atheists about one thing or another. So, anyway, I, uh, my basic take on stem cell is let's go for it. You know, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I have a really good friend who worked a few years ago at, uh, at a care facility for Alzheimer's uh, patients. And it was just very, very grim and sad. And I think that if we can eradicate that, as well as Parkinson's, cancer, this, that, or the other, you know, I think we have a responsibility to do that. Okay, anyway, Shannon is on line one. She's been waiting for a while. Shannon? Hi. Hey, um, thanks for holding. Sure. Uh, what's up? Um, I am a Christian, and mm -hmm. I was just wondering, what happens, what do you believe happens um, to you after you die? Um... I, I think that when I die, what will happen is that the electrochemical activity going on in my brain, which makes up my consciousness, will stop, and I'll be dead. Okay, well... And, and uh, I, as, as far, when, when people ask me, do I believe in it, do, do I believe in an, or what do I think of an afterlife? Um, my, my first response is, of course, hey, I'm all for it, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but I, I am not the sort of person who, who thinks that it is a good idea simply to believe things uh, because they make me feel good regardless of whether or not I have good evidence to believe in those things. I don't have evidence for an afterlife. Therefore, I think that the healthy thing for me to do personally is just to accept the reality that we are born and we live and we die and we have a time here on Earth. And, and so it's, you know, because our time is limited, it's, it's incumbent on us to make the best of it and and uh, you know, do the best we can while we're here because mm. this is what we've got. Well, do you believe you have a soul? I do not. Oh. Well. Sorry. <laughs> Hold on a second. Are you there? Yeah, I think she's. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. okay, that's okay. Uh, did you have another question? What if the Christian way is right? Ah, uh, Pascal's wager. Well, yeah, that's that's fun. To, yeah, that's you want to take that. Okay, well, yeah. sure. Um, well, what you have done is just uh, put forth Pascal's wager, put forth by Blaise Pascal. That's right. A was a mathematician. I guess he was. Uh, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And it basically said, look, uh, if I believe in God, and I'm uh, wrong, I live my life and I die and I'm just dead, then I have lost nothing. But uh, if, if you don't believe in God and you are wrong, mm -hmm. then when you die, you, you go to hell for eternity. Yeah. So it's safer to just basically believe just yeah. in case. It's, it's a cost-benefit analysis justification for believing. And, and at, at the first glance, uh, it, uh, it may sound like it could make some sense, but uh, the interesting thing is that Pascal was actually talking about Catholicism yeah. when he said that, for one. <laughs> yeah. But, well, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm wanna, sorry, I was going to say just the problem with Pascal's wager is that it's, it, uh, the reason that it gives for believing, which is, you know, there's the, there is this possibility that, that Christianity or it could be right. And so therefore, it just, it, it, just to cover your bets and just to be or on the safe side. Yeah, or, <laughs> and your butts. Just to, to be on the safe side, hey, what the heck, go ahead and believe. If Christianity does turn out to be right and you believe, well, then you get to go to heaven and everything's great. And if Christianity turns out to be wrong and you die and, you know, but, and you, but, and, but you've been a believer the whole time, well, it's not like you've lost anything, so what the heck? And the problem, and the fallacy there is, well, you know, it, it, it's not first true that you haven't lost anything. For one thing, I think that the thing that you have lost is... Um, well, let, let's say that you're a person who has, uh, you know, devoted your entire life to intense religious study, like living in a monastery or a convent or something, or, or plopping yourself down upon a rock on top of a mountain and not leaving for 40 years, or doing, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, most religious people don't do that, but if you have devoted your entire life to intense religious study and, you know, then the religion turns out to not be true and you die and you're just dead, well, you've just wasted the life you had doing something that was, you know, that was a waste of time. Uh, and then, of course, there are other factors like in the, you know, in the past, in the history that we've had, where wars that have been rooted in you know, one religion trying to con you know, beat down another religion or vice versa, 
um, you have many, many millions of people having been killed uh, because some church, you know, took up arms, and you know, they like the Roman Catholic Church with the Crusades and the Inquisition. Um, so uh, those Healthy people, for you. yeah. So those people lost quite a bit. But uh, but ultimately, the problem with the whole well, what if religions, you know, might as well believe because it may be right argument, is that uh, for one thing, it's not only just dishonest intellectually. I mean, you're just you're. It's asking you to, fear. yeah, yeah. It, it's asking you to go ahead and believe in something that you know might not be true, just in case. Yeah, but wouldn't you want to be safe just in case? Well, well, but the other thing that Pascal's wager doesn't take into account is what if, what if I'm wrong, but what if you're wrong too? What if Christianity? What if the Christian God is not the true God? What if it's Quetzalcoatl or yeah. Zeus or? Uh, well, you know, I just gotta have see, a there's no, there's, or, or any yeah. one of those. Now, or what if there is a God? But it's a God that really says, I really like those people that had the courage to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to believe in you. And he gives us <laughs> well, kudos for that. Yeah. See, the um, thing is, well, yeah, the, the whole uh, argument, it, it means... It goes on endlessly. Yeah, you might as well join, every, if, if you're just like, well, just to be safe, then you might as well just go ahead and join all 2,000 religions that are currently functioning in the world just well, to make sure you're really safe. Well, no other religions say that you have to believe in God or their God to go to heaven. Well, actually, I think there are quite a few. Like, I mean, you know, the Islam is is and Judaism are the other big monotheistic religions in the world. And for all I know, there are two thousand religions out there, and you know, I don't know what most of them say, uh, but you know, they they all seem to have their own ideas of what uh, God is and what He's called and what He looks like and what He does. And uh, you know, I mean, sure, what if yours is right? But heck, what if one of theirs is right? Okay, you never well. can tell. So let's just join them all. Let's join every religion in the world. Then we'll definitely know that we've covered every possible base we can cover and then you know if if we have a soul and we go somewhere when we die well then at least we'll go to somebody's heaven okay well you thank know. you for listening to my call and i pray for your souls anyway <laughs> okay well thank you for calling yeah see ya now my soul didn't. feels much better yeah, it does. oh is that where you I'm, keep i'm yours? feeling i keep my soul here yeah. pretty much generally yeah okay. i kept mine in my wallet but it dried out oh so. that's okay a shame. well we have john online too Hello, John. Hey, guys. Hey, how you doing? Pretty good. Let me turn up. I haven't called into you guys before, but uh, okay. I'll cool. let you figure out which side I'm on. Okay. The question <laughs> I've got is going to boil down to apologetics. Um, I kind of get a kick out of listening to uh, 970. Uh, actually, I don't know if you guys listen to radio around here, but guys like uh, Hank Hanegraaff and reading guys like Lee Strobel and kind of okay. yeah, an interesting thing, right? They, uh, I'm know, familiar they, with them. I haven't heard Hank Hanegraaff. You haven't heard that guy? I haven't heard him. No, I don't. Uh, it's, uh, I don't uh, listen to Drive Time, you know, Christian radio that much. Oh yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, you gotta, you gotta check this out. You gotta try it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you guys know about apologetics, right? Sure. Yeah. So the, my understanding is the general idea is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going against the belief and trying to sort of prove by some sort of evidence that you know this is the right thing, right? So I guess my question for you guys is, you know, a lot of people that are into this will kind of say, well, you know, Christ is the most historically documented thing ever, and Here's all the evidence, you know, for why it's true. From your perspective, uh, one of the most interesting ways to kind of, I guess, argue back on those points. And, you know, are there early historians you can quote? I mean, how early is it that people started to kind of try to debunk some of the things that are claimed? Hmm. Well, um, you now went to a seminary and uh, did right. this. And um, you know, probably a little bit better well, background in, on in that. In reality, the, the historical evidence for, for Jesus is not as as good as, as you might be led to believe mm -hmm. uh, the uh, really when you're talking about historical evidence what would be the one that would really I guess put the nail in the coffin as to whether or not uh, it would be true would probably be whether or not historians of the time or mm -hmm. secular leaders of the time not religious leaders yeah. wrote about Jesus like secular writers just historians right. or yeah, historians uh, the or the chroniclers newspaper reporters of the yeah, time of the I day. guess if you, if you will and uh, yeah. it's not there. What do we find? Yeah. Uh, it's not there. None uh, of Jesus' contemporaries seem to have said much about him, if anything. There's a small quote. Uh, is uh, Pliny the Elder? Mm, I'll look. I believe Pliny the Elder has uh, like one line, I believe, in a, in a large text that mentions Jesus and... Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger, okay. Yes, and uh, uh, this is uh, from a book, uh, the chapter on the historicity of Jesus uh, was, you know, Case Against Christianity by Michael Martin, very entertaining, informative. But it says, writings of Pliny the Younger, in a letter to the Emperor Trajan in AD 112, asking for instructions about how to deal with the Christians in the area of the Roman Empire that he governed, he describes the then-current Christian ceremonies and practices 
But again, such evidence is useless for establishing the historicity of Jesus. No, no one doubts that by that time there were Christians who worshipped Christ, and that Pliny's descriptions are accurate. But his testimony is irrelevant for establishing the history. So all he all he wrote about was that there's these folk, there's this cult. It was hearsay. Basically, yeah. there's this say? cult going on, and they're worshiping this guy. <laughs> Thank you, Arlo. And so there's this cult going on, and they're worshiping this guy, and they're doing all this stuff, and we're a little worried that they're getting out of hand. Help, Emperor! What do I do? But he doesn't actually talk about or even address whether or not this, you know, whether or not the the person of Jesus was an actual historical person. Um, there's a, there is a line from uh, Flavius Josephus, mm. there's actually a paragraph, which is now held pretty, pretty much it, it, categorically. It, it appears by historians that have uh, studied it as if it was inserted at a later date. Yeah, in it's actuality. a forgery. It, the, yeah. the text, the, the one line or the one paragraph, mm -hmm. does not fit the nature of the full text at all, and it's actually quite out of place if you yeah. read the full text. Yeah. And they believe it was inserted at a later date. Yeah, by That's so the general consensus. So, the, yeah, the long and short of it is that we really don't know a whole heck of a lot, if anything, about the, the historical Jesus or if there even was such a guy. Now, from a practical standpoint... Does that matter? Well, I don't know that it matters in terms of the fact that there is now this big world-spanning religion that we right. have to deal with, but, um, right. but it, it, it matters, I think, from, from the standpoint of, as, as our caller is talking about, apologists who want to, like, you know, bring up anything they can that will lend any sort of reality or veracity to the belief. I think that it's plausible that um, partly that there was a, a figure that probably um, inspired the character of Jesus as he was written about uh, in, in the Gospels and in the New Testament. Um, whether or not this figure was the actual figure of, of, you know, that that is depicted in there is pretty unlikely, particularly considering that the Gospels themselves can't really see eye to eye amongst themselves about you know what Jesus did or said, details or what, yeah, Jesus little details. Um, and uh, it's also widely known that there was a, a very prominent religion around the time that uh, worshipped a, a, a Messiah called Mithras, mm. whose uh, you know characteristics pretty much parallel everything that uh, you know. Almost identical. Yeah, I mean, he was like said to be born of a virgin, and and he is you know was went around healing and doing all this stuff, and then he was. Executed or crucified. I don't know. I believe he was hung on a tree hung, and he uh, raised from the dead. Hung on a tree and was raised from the dead for you know, and so, so it's you know it's interesting that uh, you know they, that they're you know what what the possible inspirations for the whole Jesus story could have been, but um, we're not you know I'm not a biblical scholar myself, but I read a lot of what you know is is written and um, there are all sorts of gaps. I mean there's there's just the amount that we don't know and the questions that are raised are far more plentiful than the actual questions that have been answered. For example, there's this whole, like, 30-year gap in Christ's life. I mean, he just, like, you know, we, you hear a little bit about him in the Gospels when he was really young, like 12, talking to the temple leaders, and then he disappears, and then he, like, pops back up again when he's 30 years old. He appears on the scene. Yeah, and, and starts, you know, being Jesus and healing folks and stuff. And, and you know, so what happened to this, like, adolescence and 20-something period of Jesus' life? You know, and then there's all kinds of wild speculation as, as to, you know, what, to, what could have gone on then. I, I saw a documentary, I think it was either on, it's either on history or PBS, where well, one person speculates that uh, Jesus could, maybe he went out to India and picked up some Buddhist teachings. Mm -hmm. Because there are some parallels in what Jesus was talking about and some Buddhist teachings about, you know, love thy neighbor and, you know, nonviolence. And, and, and Jesus was not very original. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there are many uh, religions yeah. and uh, religious writings that were around before Jesus that pretty much cover all his topics, uh, you know, love thy neighbor, all that, mm -hmm. all that stuff. He he wasn't very original. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, well so, Confucius, you know, kind of uh, credited with the golden rule. So. so yeah, it depends. I guess it depends on what's being brought up, you know, in the in the discussion. No, sorry, we can you know, again. Uh, do you have any anything else? Oh well, sure, actually, and um, you guys ought to check out Hank Canada sometime. I mean, it's like doing field research. 6 p.m. Okay. and we'll 9.70 a.m. But uh, I do have one follow-up question. Sure. So, apologetics aside, you know, what is your explanation of how it caught on so much? And I guess maybe a related thing is, uh, you know, people point back at martyrdom and, you know, why do these, why do these disciples and, and uh, sort of subsequent followers, why are they so willing to kind of put their lives on the line? Or, or maybe they weren't. You know, what's your, what's your take on all that? I'll hang up after that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think that would be uh, an area for sociology and anthropology, yeah. really, uh, when you study, you know, actually study how, mm -hmm. how it is that a religion takes on and catches on. Uh, 
but I think that uh, a critical examination of, of the Bible and the, the martyrs in the Bible mm -hmm. would show that a lot of these things were written uh, you know, after the fact, uh, mm -hmm. not by first-hand uh, person. And it's, it's like, uh, I, I would tie a lot of it into embellishment after the fact. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul worked very hard to, to uh, strengthen Christianity and, you know, uh, traveling to Rome and all the rest of it. Um, it was, I think he saw in Christianity the path to power. Yes. And so he was, you know, more instrumental than, you know, just, just about anyone, probably including, you know, Jesus himself, you know, if you're in, in, in getting Christianity going mm -hmm. as this, uh, you know, force to be reckoned with on a worldwide scale. So anyway, Curtis is on line three. Let's talk to well, Curtis? Hey, guys. Hey, what's up? Uh, well, I hope the, the, the caller, I think two calls back, is still listening, because I, I had a comment about Pascal's wager. Oh, go ahead. Um, something that is, is often brought up in, rela in uh, regards to that is that uh, on, the side that's, on, on, the, on the side that says, let's be safe mm -hmm. and believe in God just in case the Christian religion is correct, I'll end up in heaven, and if, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know the argument. Uh, something to be said is that supposing that you are correct doesn't the Christian God say that there are certain reasons why you should believe in him and why you should uh, have faith uh, and I, I couldn't tell you exactly what the reasons are that you're supposed to worship him or whatnot but I'm pretty sure they're not just to be safe I'm sure that's not one of them <laughs> so so what you're saying is the Christian God probably wouldn't be pleased if on judgment day you stood in front of him and said I believed in you to cover my ass <laughs> exactly I mean the, you know it, and there's nothing wrong with you know thinking this through out loud, it's a good thought experiment. If this God really did exist, he would know that you weren't doing it out of the goodness of your heart. You were doing it to play it safe. And so, you know, mm -hmm. it sort of fails on that on that mm -hmm. account. No fire insurance policy, right. Yeah, right. I, really, I really don't think it's a valid line uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to even claim to be playing it safe, aside from the very valid point that you brought up, that there are lots of other religions that you could be following to play it safe. Sure. You know, but I think that the most blistering and damning criticism of Pascal's Wager that you can make is that it is essentially a fundamentally, as you pointed out, selfish argument. It's you're believing in God because you want a big prize. Okay, you want the booby prize at the end of the, sh you know, you want you want the reward for believing in God. And it, it, you know, it, it, and you're afraid of the punishment. And so, even though you may have intellectual reasons for doubting, ultimately it comes down to, well, you know, but if I believe and it turns out that it's all true you know, I'll get the big prize at the bottom of the cereal box, and that would be really nice, so I'll go ahead and believe for that reason. So it's, it's ultimately a very, it's, it's a very self, selfish reason for, you know, having these beliefs. And, of course, he's saying, obviously, an omniscient and omnipotent God would know. Well, he would know that, you yeah. You can't fool right. Mother right. Nature, that sort of thing. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that's you a can't, good point. You can't fool an omnipotent being. This is the thing. I mean, omnipotence always trumps non-omnipotence. Yeah. yeah, so it's like you can't, uh, you know, you can't really do anything, presumably, or having, um, you know, or, 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 or um, I'm sorry, I just got a note from the refute, quote, you can will yourself to believe whatever you want. Steve is saying this, our producer. <laughs> yeah, and then I, but I guess it determines, you know, the, what, what, to what degree delusion is playing a part in that is, it matters, you know. Right? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, you can, yeah. Like, like, I can't just decide. I can't wake up tomorrow and just decide that I believe in Thor. Okay? Or I can't wake up and just decide that um, I don't know what my own name is. You know? You can't just decide to go against something that, you know, all of your rational thought processes are directing you towards. You know? That, Unless it, you are just being completely willfully ignorant and are throwing rationalism sort of to the winds in, in the first place. And that's, that's a really good point, because on a certain level, if someone were to ask me, you know, why don't you believe in God, uh -huh. I, I could try and rationalize it and think all I like why I don't, but the simple fact is I simply lack that belief. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know, you know, if it was the upbringing or if I just have some kind of extremely logical, rational insight mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, that led me to, to not fall into that trap, but I, I don't have that belief, and I couldn't mm -hmm. just make myself believe it any more than I could make myself believe that, that I'm a car. You know, I could yeah. start telling myself every day that I was, but it wouldn't make me really believe it. Yeah. Of course, you could be evil and just hellbound. Well, I am. Yeah. I am. So <laughs> just 
Bottom line. Yes. But uh, at any rate, it's always uh, there with a positive thought for the day. Yeah, I like yeah. you, good, good <laughs> show, guys. Well, David's uh, here for I'll, the I'll affirmations of the, hey, right, the day. Hey. Thank you for calling. Yeah, thanks, Curtis. Good point. Uh, yeah, Curtis pops my uh, godless gamers every now and again. <laughs> He's one of our guys. Um, yeah, I mean, it's you. Uh, what it boils down to is that if you don't have any reason to believe in something, then there's no reason to believe, believe in that right, thing. That's you know? Right. Um, you know, you can uh, and but. If you can come up with a reason, you can just say, well, I'll believe in it just because it makes me feel good. And at that point, then, well, the, 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 the intellectual honesty of it all or the, the ethics, as it, as it were, of the situation, I guess that's just up to your own conscience. Well, you know, and I find a, a very, and there are those Christians Culture. that do follow this belief pattern, but they're mm -hmm. um, a minority. Uh, very, uh, a lot of the Christians obviously believe that the God of the Bible exists and that the Bible is true, mm -hmm. but they can't find it in themselves to believe the passages that say, pick up that snake and drink that poison. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what's, and, 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 and the reason that they can't do that is because, well, for one, it directly involves them doing an act that they know would be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So their common sense takes over there, mm -hmm. but it doesn't take over in the big picture. Yeah. So. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all pick and choose what works for you. And so. All right, who is next? Aaron on line one is next. We'll see what he has to say. Hello, hey, Aaron. how you doing, guys? Hey, thanks good. For, thanks for waiting. All right, no problem. Listen, I just called in to give you the perspective of a uh, Christian who believes solely in order to reap that reward at the end. Okay. There's no other reason that I believe in Jesus except that I want to go to heaven and not hell. Okay. okay. Actually, I'm not going to be able to stay in that one. So just forget it. I'm on your side. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, at least you're honest. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, um... <laughs> Check it out. The interesting thing about that whole thing, um, and, and you know, it's funny because I get to tie up Pascal to Hank Hanegraaff here. But one thing <laughs> that one thing that Hank always talks about, I'm a pretty big fan too, is how. Um, let me put it this way: He rips on Catholicism on the grounds that they somehow believe that even though you're saved by faith as a Christian, that you still, when you do good works, that they're meritorious. Hank, on the other hand, believes that. If you, you're, you're saved by faith alone and works aren't meritorious, but essentially if you really and genuinely and truly believe that you'll still do good works. So the more you think about it, the less sense it really makes, I think, because it kind of <laughs> comes down, you know. But anyway, that kind of, you know, Nix is the argument that you can, you know, wager on the one side or the other and... Uh, right, well, sure. ...come away with it. But here's the biggest issue that I have with Pascal's wager, and... Um, mm -hmm might be a little bit of a long-winded explanation, if you'll bear with me, but um, it, it has to do with the notion of what this God represents, what the God of the Bible is. And in essence, no matter... That we're supposed to believe that God is good, and we're supposed to say all sorts of good things about Him, right? Nevertheless, we're supposed to believe that there exists this hell that some people are going to go to. And no matter how good this God is, if people... Let me take a step back. Who decides what pisses God off? <laughs> Well, God, God, right? Would, you know, so if he mean, creates a, speed, a race of beings who are capable of pissing him off, and he <laughs> preserves this hell for them, <laughs> then by sheer statistics and the law of averages, without mm -hmm. any sort of you know good or evil existence in the world, just by sheer statistics, the a certain number of people, people are, are going to be consigned to that eternal torment. Yeah, there, there's like this number of people who are only born to die and go to hell, in which which pretty much sets up the whole the, which. Predetermination. And yeah, well, it's the whole thing uh, that, um, you know, the, uh, the, well, the whole Christian plan of salvation at that point falls apart. It becomes a big sham. If there are certain people out there who either, because they never received the message of Christianity, or because, um, uh, and, and here's, a, here's an interesting ethical dilemma. Um, there, because there are some Christians who, that I've spoken to who believe that a person, if they are purely innocent, in their disbelief for God. In other words, uh, well, purely innocent. what I mean by that is their reason for not believing in God is because they never heard of him. There's some, you know, pygmy living off in a cave somewhere and, uh, you know, they, they've, they've never even, they've never, you know, seen, uh, you know, of, is someone from a more civilized land. They're not acquainted with, um, you know, the, the Christian religion concepts. And so this person lives their entire life in isolation in their little island thinking that, uh, you know, they're all that exists. They die. I've heard some Christians say, well, I don't believe that person would go to hell because he never really had an opportunity to get the message. And so, you know, clearly that would be unfair. Mm -hmm. Then the problem is, um, well, let's say that what if some missionary sails his little boat out to the Pygmies Island 
and he introduces um, Jesus's uh, Arlo. Thank you. <laughs> There's a little baby. That's a, is that a pygmy noise or a baby noise? Uh, that, that's my son saying a few words about pure innocence. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was Arlo's, one of Arlo's baby noises or something. Anyway, let's say some missionary sails his boat out to this little pygmy's island, and uh, he delivers the word unto this pygmy. Okay, and the pygmy thinks about it and goes, hmm, nah, you know, just kind of sounds silly to me. You know, I'll stick with whatever I've got. Well then, isn't that missionary now responsible for the pygmy's consignment into hell? He has introduced this pygmy to the idea of Christianity, and the pygmy has rejected it and is now doomed to hell, whereas if the missionary had just stayed at home and left this little guy isolated on his island, <laughs> and he never heard of it, and he, he could have just, going, yeah, he could have gotten... He'd be up there with the missionary, right? Yeah, he could have gotten a pass, you know, and saying, all right, you know, we'll give you a break. So, it's, it's very... But here's the whole thing. Here's, here's what it all boils down to, is that I just cannot reconcile this whole idea of a loving, benevolent God with a place of eternal punishment in the first place. It just doesn't compute, okay? Right. Any being that loves, anyone who loves you for any reason doesn't want to see you get really, really hurt. Even if, you know, you, you have problems or, you know, you have, you, you have a falling out with this person or what have you or... or, or you know, if someone really, really loves you, they're, they're, they, they may have arguments and what have you, but they really don't want to see you ever get hurt. They never want to see you sad or feeling bad or unhappy or what have you, much less tormented for all eternity. Well, that, you know, that's what makes it even worse. Even, even eternity, your blood will boil, your bones will burn, and your marrow will be reduced to a putrid black slime! <laughs> And that brings up a good point because it's what's what's even worse about it is that according to the the Christians, I will receive eternal punishment for mm -hmm. a finite life mm -hmm. for choices I made in a finite time. Yeah, there's no rehabilitative. Yeah, quality there's no to, no rehabilitation in hell. No no time off for good behavior. No work release program. It just highlights yeah. the cruelty inherent in in the entire creed. Yeah, right. But I think that that that's where um, the real loss in Pascal's wager comes in. I mean, uh, the notion that you don't lose anything if you're wrong, the fact is what you lose is your personal, you know, based on your upbringing or whatever else, your conscience, you, you have to surrender in order to buy into that. Your notions of justice, of goodness, of righteousness, and everything else. Well, I would agree. Yeah, so that's very important. Yeah, I would agree. All right, well, um, thanks for your call, Aaron. We're going to get to the next folks unless you had something else for us. Oh, no, I'm done. Have fun. All right, man. Well, right, uh, you, talk to you later. Bye. Okay. Julia is online too, been holding for some time. Julia? Hi. Hi. I get a little feedback um, from you. Sorry, I need to mute my TV. Uh, yeah. Okay. I always have to remember to do um, that. What's up? I have some questions for y'all. And first of all, one of them from one of the guys, I guess the last guy, y'all were talking about hell and how um, if God was a good God, he wouldn't create a hell. But um, nowhere does it say that God did create hell. Um, so he had then a are fallen you angel that decided not to follow the Lord, and so he, in turn, made hell. And um, so, so Satan God created did not hell. Can you point me to his hell? That's one thing. Okay, can and you point me to that scripture? I also want to know um, where in the Bible does it say that uh, God commanded us to drink poison and eat? Oh, it? Uh, that would be uh, Paul's writing, I believe. Oh, uh, which he wrote a lot. Yeah, that's the whole thing. It's yeah, so uh, you got to have these quotes if yeah, you're going to quote them. Paul's. Is it Paul? Is it Corinthians? So I cannot. Corinthians? No, well, I cannot remember. I'd have to look mm, it up. Mm, 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 okay. <laughs> However, you caught it. Anyway, it is yeah. there, and uh, uh, if you if you would like to. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Arlo. If you would like to uh, tune in next week, I will bring the verse and the context in which it was written. So uh, you okay. Christians are commanded to drink poison. It says that uh, you you will, uh, as a Christian, you. Uh, it is not a command that you must. I believe it says that as a Christian, uh, you can take up poisonous snakes and drink poison, and you will not oh, be harmed. That's what you mean, and, and that is the basis for these guys who are called the, the shakers. Yes, who handle do the, snake the rattlesnakes handling. and things. That's because right. there is this passage that says if if your your faith is enough, that you can hand that you can pick up a poisonous snake. And, the uh, last twenty verses of the book of Mark. There you go. You look it up. You can um, you can handle the you can handle venomous reptiles or something and be bitten, and you will not be harmed because you know the the power of, of faith uh, compels you or what have you. And there is this group 
of um, ver there's this very fundamentalist religious sect of Christians called the, the Shakers, who, as part of their service, handle like rattlesnakes and vipers. Uh, here we go. And sometimes Our faith compels you. Yeah, and they sometimes like die from this. Okay, here it is. Uh, really starting in uh, Mark 16. Okay. Let me start with chapter uh, 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. Okay. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Okay. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Uh, and this is what uh, Jesus said to them. Okay. So apparently... There are particular signs that will accompany those Christians that have proper belief in Jesus. One of them being, uh, you can cast out demons, you'll speak in tongues, you'll pick up snakes in their hands, and you can drink any deadly thing and it will not hurt you. Weird. Well, maybe there are some Christians who do that, but it's, not, it's obviously not a command telling you to do that. It's saying that right. there are Christians mm -hmm. that do do that, and there are Christians that uh, lay their hands on people, and people are healed. So uh, I, I, uh, I, well, we just, certainly just question that. What you said earlier about commanding. No, no. What I, what um, I actually said was that Christians uh, can they look at the whole thing and they believe in general uh, in the Bible, but when the Bible says specific things, such as you can pick up a snake and you can drink a poison, which any deadly thing would count as a poison, and you won't be harmed, uh, uh, only a very small percentage of them do that. And by the way, when they do that, they get bit by snakes and get harmed, or they drink poison yeah. and they get harmed. Uh, only a very small percentage do that because it flies in the face of common sense. Yeah. That's, that was my main point. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks. However, uh, can, I, can I move on to another question? Yeah. Well, I'm not as interested. Well, let me. Uh, okay. Well, um, we'll let you have one more, but I also want to address something. You're talking something the hell issue too. Yeah. I want to. I want to address the hell. Well, thing I, that I don't really. I have another really big one that I want to get to. If y'all are only going to do a few, then okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I would like to move on to this one. Okay. Okay. Um, you said earlier that um, if if there is no God and I devote myself to religious study, then it's a waste of life. But y'all are devoting yourselves to the study of no God, wouldn't that also be a waste of, <laughs> a waste of life? Well, um, well, just, first of all, what you we have, were doing was we were... You have no goal to go towards well, whatsoever. Well, hang on, hang on. I'm going I'm to answer you now. Um, we were describing the central argument of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of something called Pascal's Wager, which is an argument for belief in God, which, which, in, which implies that a good it's a good reason to go ahead and believe in God because... You know, uh, there may be one, and whether or not you have good evidence for one, um, if you believe and it turns out that there is one, um, then, well, you'll be fine, and you'll be covered and be in heaven and everything will be all right. Whether, wh whereas, if, it if you go ahead and you believe and it turns out that there's not a God, you haven't really lost anything. And I was arguing that you do lose something if you believe something that isn't true. Uh, one of which could be a very useful and practical life that could very well have been spent doing something more meaningful. But, um, so that was what I was talking about in terms of, uh, uh, you know, my criticism of, of Pascal's wager argument. Um, now, as far as this is concerned, I, you know, yeah, this is not my life vocation. This is a thing, this is a show we do on the weekends. It's fun. Uh, the atheist uh, community of Austin was put together as mostly a social group for atheists to get together and hang out. And this show is just our public outreach and, and, and in the interests of, you know, talking to Christians like yourself and explaining what atheists think about stuff and also to communicate with other atheists. Just let us know we're here. Um, this isn't like a vocation. You know, I'm not an atheist minister who, you know, <laughs> just, that's not my, it's not my job. I, my, my, my vocation is something else entirely. But um, anyway, but I, want, I, I do want to get back to the, the, uh, the, the definition of hell that you provided, whereas you mentioned that, uh, the, okay, there's Lucifer, the fallen angel, and you're saying that he is responsible for the creation of hell. Uh, now, this brings up a couple of questions immediately to me, which is, well, first off, I thought that within the Christian framework of thing, things, God, w that Satan could not be a creative force. I thought that that was pretty much uh, limited to well, God. The, the angels were created solely to worship God and do his bidding. Yeah. And if Satan could take a third of all the angels of heaven and rebel them against God, that shows some pretty poor planning on God's part, apparently. Well, there's that, and there's also the question of, okay, if, if hell was a place that was created by Satan so that satanic stuff could go on uh, in, in opposition to God, 
why would God then say, or decide essentially to kind of, it almost sounds like there's a joining of forces going on. God is saying, oh, okay, well this hell place seems like a really neat place to send people if they decide that they don't want to worship me or believe in my son Jesus or any of that. So it's like, you know, why would God go along with anything that Satan decided to do, including you know, making use of the hell that you say Satan created to put all of these folks that he did, that don't believe in him in. Well, if you know? Satan owns hell, does God pay rent to send all this? Uh, yeah, maybe there's a timeshare thing. I but you know, know. The, the, the real problem, honestly, is that once again, what we have here is an example of a Christian who does not believe their God is as powerful as he's supposed to be. Uh, as a Christian, uh, God is supposed to, uh, the caller who mentioned hell and, and basically tried to say God's not responsible for hell. Hell's a big, bad, horrible thing. God's not responsible for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so Julia is supposed to believe in God, and according to the Bible, God's omniscient and omnipotent. Therefore, God created everything, knew everything ahead of time. God ultimately bears responsibility. If I, also, if also I give birth, or, well, if I could give birth, but I gave birth to a child that I knew I knew would grow up to be a mass murderer, and I went ahead and did it and raised that child, I am ultimately responsible for those people's deaths because I had foreknowledge of that, and okay, I allowed it to go on. You are shortchanging your own God, mm -hmm. and you need to understand what omniscience and omnipotent mean. Okay, but God created us um, with oh, a free, free will. will. We are not robots. Free will. And so, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't tell us, do this or do that. Um, it, it's, he, he said, this is your decision. You can either follow me or you cannot follow me. I got a good free one. But um, one thing that, the, the problem with that I don't understand is that if there is no God, then wouldn't everything be permissible, even crime? So Absolutely no God, not. Absolutely no, not. No and I'll tell you why. Or evil, there would be no heaven nor hell. There would be mm. no. There would be no Satan. Then there would be no evil, and I could go and. Please, you're tearing me up. You're talking about Nirvana here. Yeah, um, let me, I'll go ahead and address this. First off, uh, I'll start with free will and then I'll move on to, to um, how to, how but you... But we will do it quickly. We yeah. have two callers that do need to get on. Okay. The guy on the right, could he move his microphone up? I can't really hear him at all. Oh, me? Phone. Not okay. you, that Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, shirt. you're right. Oh, I hope this doesn't matter. Yeah, I can't okay. really hear him. Right. Okay, oh, hey, hang yeah. on. I, I got that. Okay. Um, okay, first off, the free will argument is completely irrelevant to the problem of evil. Okay. God giving people free will, okay, does not excuse him from being a morally responsible being. Okay, again, uh, if, if, the, if the, ar the argument that is made that human beings have free will and it is because of this free will that evil men thwart the desires of God, which, you know, or which are that everybody should be good all the time, and that's why evil stuff happens. The problem is, again, we're getting back to what David brought up, which is the question of omniscience and omnipotence. Regardless of whether or not human beings have been given free will, if you know that an evil event is going to occur, you have a moral responsibility to do something about it. Okay, If I knew, if, if I have foreknowledge that the September 11th attacks were going to occur, I would have done absolutely everything in my power to stop it. What I called the FBI, the CIA, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, what I called the Pentagon, but what I called the White House. Hang on, accident. hang on. We uh, have, we have hang become on. closer as a nation. Good Julia, Julia, I'm not done. Because of God. Julia, oh, please. Julia, oh, I'm not, not stop. Please I'm don't not. mock me. I'm just trying to. Julia, get my I'm not done opinion. with my explanation. What you're saying is that God sits on His big throne and allows evil things to happen because He does not want to interfere with human free will. My question to you is, whose free will is more important? You know, there are when you ha when an evil act occurs, there's two groups of people. You have the people doing the evil act, the bad guys, and then you have their victims. Okay, and the victims have free will too, don't they? I mean, don't victims have free will to decide, I don't want to be victimized, I don't want to be hurt, I don't want a big jet airplane to crash into my building while I'm just sitting here answering my emails. I don't want to die today, you know. So whose free will is more important? Let's use the September 11th again as an example. Is, was the free will of the 19 men who crashed those airplanes more important than the free will of the 2,900 people who died in those incidents, you know? You're trying to say that God does not interfere in acts of evil because he doesn't want to interfere in free will, but it's not a question of free will. It's a question of moral responsibility. You know? If how, somebody, how, if somebody attacked you, you on the street... How can you talk about moral responsibility 
if you don't believe in a God, what makes things moral and immoral? Uh, do you believe that your God is what makes morality? No, I th I'm saying without and, a God, there would be no moral. Okay, so... Uh, how? So, so how is that the you case? You believe that your God is... Wait, is, uh, I want to know how, there, how the question, the existence or non-existence of a God is even relevant to the question of morality. Because... How uh, would there, how, why would there be no morality if there were no God? Are you saying that it's because morality comes from a God? If that's the case, why doesn't this God act in a morally responsible fashion and prevent evil acts from occurring that, being omniscient, he knows are going to happen? If morality come, how can morality come from a being that never exhibits any moral responsibility to the people he created? None. Because we live in a fallen world, and a none fallen of us are world. perfect. I mean, this For, okay, this first of all, uh, real quickly, let me demolish the free will argument in about 20 seconds. Okay. Okay. First of all, you say that we have free will, but let me explain something to you, and you should know this as a Christian. We live in a fallen world because we have, according to your belief, a sinful nature. We have all fallen short uh, without God, and therefore we, we all deserve hell un until we ask God to intercede for us. Yes. Uh, and we all have a sinful nature. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, let me explain something to you. Free will with a sinful nature that basically compels us to do evil is not free will at all. It's like playing a card game or a dice game with loaded dice, throwing those dice, and then being forced to abide by the consequences of the roll of that unfair, uh, uh, unfairly weighted dice to begin with. It's not fair in any universe that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, the, so the free will thing doesn't make sense. If we are immediately from the outset wrong, then that's not free will. We have a sinful nature to saddle us to do the wrong thing and we have to have God from the beginning. That is not free in any definition you could even begin to come up with for one. No. So but you get to yeah. choose whether you want you don't you, you don't have we to have a sinful yeah. nature to a meaning we say, are saddled at the this, outset. Or I can choose not to do this. I can choose yeah. to do the right thing or but, the wrong uh, thing. I mean, but how do but you again, know? But again, Julia, you, you it, haven't it, answered my question well, yet. Well, Julia, no, I if, have. I just If there is no God, then everything Julia, I can't answer your question if you won't let me. I could go murder everybody kind of thing. Well, hang on. Wait, would you wait, stop. Would you? Stop. Are you saying to me that if you, let's say you find evidence tomorrow somehow that there's no God, would you go out and hurt someone because of that? Would you decide, oh, I just found out that God doesn't exist. I'm going to go out and kill a person. Would you do that? Would you really do that? If, I, I don't know. I just, you don't I just know? I mean, you, you don't, don't know. know. You don't know you whether or not. You can't even begin to question us on morality if you don't know you, whether or not you'd go kill somebody tomorrow. You, you honestly just, mean I, that I, you don't God, know? You're insulting that, us. That would change my entire life. I wouldn't know it would? who I would, you know. It I, would? Hang without on. Without God, would, there would be no point to life whatsoever. It, what? What? <laughs> it, you, mean, you mean to say that you don't, you honestly, honestly you're telling us that you don't know if you found out tomorrow that there was no big invisible man in the sky He's whispering not an rules in your ear, man in the sky, please don't mock me. Well, don't Julie. insult me by saying that I definitely have no reason to not go out and start killing babies and kicking cats. I'm just, I'm just asking you to answer my question. Okay. What I mean, if if there is no God, would you agree that everything would be permissible? Why no. Why is there to judge us? Why no. do we have the right to? And to again, have in sync. Authority over no. crime and everything. No, it, it is not all right to go and do what you want. We have. Just, how we, do you we, know we, that? We we cannot. Because first of all, we, there's no way we're going to be able to get to the other yeah, two callers, and we apologize yeah. for that. We're going to spend the last two minutes. We're going to go ahead and cut Julia off because we're running out of we're time. We're running out of time, but we're not. We're going to finish the last two minutes of the show on your question. Okay. And we have to cut the other callers off. We apologize. Oh, hold it up. Uh, uh, so Andrew and Craig, please call back next week. We okay. want your call. Um, and we appreciate your call, Julia. It's all right. Wow. Okay. Um, um, boy, where do you even begin? If well, first of all, you know, uh, you don't need a religion to dictate what common sense says you need to live together as a society. It's yeah. very simple. We, whether we have a God or not doesn't matter in terms of living together in a society. We could not live together in a society if people did whatever they wanted. Yeah. And there are other... Society is a practical through history. consideration. Actions it's have practical. consequences. Actions have consequences. You can observe this. It's not rocket science, okay? And but it amazes me. It amazes me to think that, I mean, there are actually people out there who would say, 
I don't know whether or not I, I would, would go kill. out and kill someone. Somebody like that has no right to act like they're morally superior and, to and us. And finally, Sorry. before a yeah. Christian who believes in the Bible calls and counsels us morality, start looking through your own Bible and see the highly immoral acts that your God committed to women and children throughout the history of that book. And then come and tell me about morality. Yeah, anyway. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Um, that was our show for this week. I will not be here next week. David will be hosting. He'll have a co-host and he'll determine who that is. Appreciate it. Christians, we don't hate you. We, we just, just think, think you're wrong. wrong. Thanks for watching. Uh, listen to Nonprofit Saturdays at 2. I need a vacation. Holy shit. Excellent. Holy crap. Excellent.